in 1900, only birds soared above California's Channel Islands. But in 1912, a new era opened. For the first time, a motorized airplane landed in the waters off Catalina Island. The flight marked the beginning of Catalina's aviation history. On May 10th, 1912, Glenn Martin circled the town of Avalon, completing a 27-minute flight from Newport Beach to Catalina. At the time, it was history's longest overwater flight. An excited crowd witnessed the historic landing. Martin's flight established him as one of aviation's foremost pioneers, and it also intrigued two young boys that afternoon. Herb Wegman and John Wendell. The two men recall that very special afternoon. I ran out in the yard, I looked up in the air, and here was a plane overhead. So naturally, all those kids, we started running to the front street to see what was happening. So as we get down the front street, we saw the plane land on the South Beach here, which is now known as the South Beach, over at Avalon. And uh, as he did land, why well, he punched a hole he did in the bottom of the, of the pontoon. We were quite thrilled, of course, to see him come over and see him get out, see him step out of the plane, take off his, his inner tube. But I guess he was quite surprised to see such a crowd because half the town naturally came down to see him or were there to meet him. I guess they were all there before he finally left. There was a fellow, an aviator from San Francisco by the name of Lincoln Beachy that had talked for months about flying to Catalina. And he was going to have boats stationed all across the channel in case he should go down. And something that always come up, the weather wouldn't be right, and Beachy would cancel out. So as I understand it, Martin said one day, well, I'll just hook a pontoon on the plane and come on over. As Johnny said, he had a land plane, but a friend of his had a little pontoon, like, a, like what we used to call a punt. And he just fastened that in place of his wheels and took off. No one knew he was coming over here. When the uh, plane went off, took off, we watched it. In fact, we never left the place until it did go off. And when it did go off, why the patch that they had put on fell off. We saw it fall from the plane as it came down. And as he went back, they wired back to Newport Beach then to tell him that the patch had fallen off the plane, off his pontoon, because they were afraid if he was forced down, he would probably sink on the way. And anyway, they wanted him to get up on the land as soon as he landed over there. So they watched out. He didn't have to land, of course, on the way back until he got there. Art Burns, pilot for Charlie Chaplin's half-brother Sid, made history by flying the first commercial airline flight in California, direct from San Pedro to Avalon. Newspaper delivery was a daily chore for Chaplin Airlines, and screen star Edna Proviance had the honor of delivering the first shipment. John Wendell was there for the inaugural flight. And uh, the reason I was there at that particular time, my father was also the news uh, dealer here. He had the, both the Times the Examiner, the Herald, and the Record, and, the, and all the newspapers. And, uh, uh, and I had to meet the plane to get the papers, because they brought newspapers on the first plane that came over it. And when he got here, why well, the plane broke down. And uh, so Art Burns, who was a pilot, he was a, a lieutenant of the Navy, the first pilot that Ch Ch Sid Chaplin had. Why, well, uh, he, he, he had me row him out daily to help keep, keep the plane clean on the kind of seagulls used to fly around and, the, and they do drop ones on it and it was get pretty dirty. And I helped him clean that up, plus the fact rolling him out. And he said if I, if I uh, uh, would help him, well, I, he would take me back, be the first passenger out of Catalina, uh, the first commercial plane, which I was. From short, small excursion planes flown by adventurous pilots such as Hal Holloway to the huge, cumbersome pony blimp from which anglers excitedly fished for Barracuda, Catalina aviation became a fascinating part of the Roaring Twenties.
Cove, which was located uh, just north of the casino, past what was the St. Catherine Hotel, uh, happened to be discussed at a dinner that my father and I were at with Mr. Phil Wrigley of his residence. And he was trying to decide where to locate the uh, seaplane base uh, because he was mighty interested in trans air transportation to Catalina. So the thought came up of uh, Hamilton Beach, and it was around midnight, and he, he said, well, let's get in the car and we'll go over and take a look at it. So we all hopped in his open Duesenberg and went over to uh, Hamilton Beach where the, he had a big spotlight on it, and they decided right then and there that that would be the place to put the uh, seaplane base. And so that's how it actually was located at Hamilton Beach. And uh, from there, they, uh, it was a ro very rocky beach and a mountain right, right behind it. And so they, uh, they built the ramp out of the water, and the idea was to how to turn the plane around. So Mr. Wrigley thought of the railroad turntables turning steam locomotives around. So they conceived the idea of a turntable at the head of the ramp. The seaplane would come out of the water, up the ramp. When it got on the turntable, it would rev one of its engines, and that would turn the plane right around and be ready to head down the ramp again. And of course, the terminal itself was up to the canyon above there, and they built a, a ramp and for the planes after they were up on the turntable. When they put them away, they'd take them up to the hangar. And then I came into the job of designing the little terminal building, which they wanted a Spanish-type building. And so we had a very beautiful little Spanish building with a tower and a two-story building, the offices upstairs, the waiting room below, refreshment stand, and they had a beautiful garden in the front facing the, the ocean and the operation of the planes. And it was a very popular place for people to go over and sit and watch the activities. Now, the first planes to run on the line, and this was in August, uh, I think the air terminal was dedicated in August of 1931. And the first plane that came out to run was a loaning that Mr. Wrigley had some connection with back in Chicago. And they flew it out, and that was the first plane to start the, the commercial runs. The loanings, they called them the boots, they had a big pontoon on the bottom, and a, a prop, the propeller and engine, was in the front. So it did look kind of like a flying boot, and it would only hold, I think, six passengers. And then he got another loaning. And by that time, Mr. Uh, Wrigley, who was a very good friend of Donald Douglas Sr., the, the man that started the Douglas aircraft, they were very good friends, and Mr. Douglas used to bring his yacht over here, so he was boat-minded. He said, I'm going to design a, a, a boat hull with, and make an uh, amphibian out of it that will really cut the water good and be very stable. So he designed the uh, Douglas Dolphin Amphibians, as they were called. And uh, the Catalina Airlines eventually well, it was called the Wilmington Catalina Airline Limited. It was the official name of the company that Mr. Wrigley established. And we ended up with, uh, I think, four, and f four of the Douglas Dolphins, and they performed great service. They flew right into Wilmington on the harbor, right, landed in the harbor by the boat terminal where the steamer landed. Now, one of the advertising slogans they had was the smallest airport in the world or the largest landing field of the Pacific Ocean. But some people just weren't satisfied landing on the water. Entrepreneur Justin Dart became the first person to land in the island's interior. Malcolm Renton again picks up the story. Mr. Wrigley's uh, Arabian horse ranch up in the interior near Little Harbor had a, a sloping, uh, large sloping grain field down toward Little Harbor. And Justin Dart was a very good friend of Mr. Wrigley, who was from Chicago, and he uh, had this airplane. He said, if you'd kind of smooth out the field a bit, I, I can come in with a twin-engine uh, plane. So we, Huey Smith, uh, Bud, Bud Smith's father was there, and he graded the field off a bit. 
it was very dusty, <laughs> but they stirred up. And so we all went up there to see Justin Dart fly in, and he, he flew in and landed safely, and so that was uh, about the largest, first largest land plane to come in. Dart's landing kicked off a new era in Catalina aviation and spearheaded construction of the fabled airport in the sky. Bud Smith, a United Airlines pilot and the son of one of the engineers who helped build the airfield, describes how construction affected the island. A uh, funny thing happened after they started construction and leveled the hill off, it actually changed the weather patterns that developed and we got a lot more low clouds after the, the uh, airport itself was constructed due to a gradual adiabatic rising that was formed by the leveling off of the airport, uh, of the mountains itself, because they knocked off three hill, uh, three mountains, three peaks, and filled in the, the valleys to get their 3,100 feet of runway that they needed. The first airline, as far as I know, was United Airlines. And United Airlines started their operation, uh, I believe, in early 1947. And incidentally, I was a pilot for United Airlines, having been born and raised here in the island and uh, departed to go to work for United. And I did fly into the airport here uh, many times in that operation. Now, the equipment that they used was the Douglas DC-3. And there was two airplanes that were assigned to nothing but the Catalina operation. Uh, these two aircraft had been sleepers on United Airlines fleet and they were converted, uh, partitions were put in and they were, the seating capacity was increased from 22 passengers to 28 passengers. And in those days I had just first started out on the airline and I was a co-pilot in the DC-3. And uh, I, it was, I loved it. The airport in the sky was indeed a break with the past, but certainly not a complete one. 25 years after Glenn Martin's historic flight, Herb Wegman organized a celebration commemorating the event's silver anniversary. Well, the whole town took part in it. In fact, is all the newspapers on the mainland gave it very good publicity, and they, a lot of the f local folks dressed up in old-time costumes, uh, costumes of the days when he first made his flight here. They met him down at the at the pier as he came ashore and took him up to the St. Catherine with some bathing beauties on his car and one thing or another. I'd been in correspondence with him quite a few times since then and on the 50th anniversary I wrote to him again and talked about having a 50th anniversary but uh, he was getting of course along in years. He said he didn't know whether he'd be able to make the flight but he was very much interested in it. At the, on the first flight that he made over here, the commemorative flight, his mother came with him because his mother was instrumental, I guess, in getting him to fly to Catalina because she always encouraged his flying. So he brought her over on that first flight, and he said at this time that his mother was too old and wasn't well enough to make the trip. He thought that I should, because I had worked so hard on this celebration, that I should uh, fly back on it. So he wrote to Pan American Airways, and they said, fine, but the only way they could do it would be to issue me a ticket. So they issued a ticket for me to fly from Avalon to Newport Beach. It's a, a ticket for the shortest flight that Flan American ever made. The past glories of amphibian air travel were rekindled by Avalon Air Transport, an aviation firm owned and operated by Walt von Kleinschmidt and Dick Probert. Once again, airplanes took off from the Pacific Ocean. Dick Probert recalls those early days. Well, the first day, uh, which was about two round trips. We carried a total of six passengers. And uh, that amount doubled every day for the first week until we were up over to 100 passengers a day. And of course, we didn't get started until August the 27th. And as you know, uh, at that time, the business went to pot by July the f or by uh, September the 15th and uh, I had no idea what the winter held in store for me and if it hadn't have been for uh, counter personnel at United Airlines who looked favorably upon us 
giving us passengers when the airport was fogged in, we might not have made it through the first winter. However, we did, and uh, the Jim Trout was a passenger on one of those early and adventurous Avalon air transport flights. Well, uh, originally the two pilots that started the airline, the one of them was kind of flew by the seat of his pants, but uh, they load the planes up with passengers and he'd get into the plane and he'd kind of look around and look up and he says, there's a pilot seat here. He'd look up at the throttle, he says, well, this looks like it ought to start the engine. He says, I think we'll make it all right. And, of course, some of the passengers never flown before were kind of upset, and, of course, particularly in landing in the water because of very few people had landed in the water, and it felt almost like you were going under, and there'd be some, sometimes gas at the time when you hit the water. Passenger service is only one of the business enterprises of Avalon Air Transport. But uh, I think the second year I was in business with Gooses, I went after the mail. And... Uh, the mail was what they call a star route, which means you carry everything. First class mail, parcel, post, anything that anybody wants to put a tag on and send through the mail, we had to carry. And uh, this was no problem because it generally did not involve over two mail sacks a day, which we could put in our baggage compartment. Except when Sears Roebuck decided to send their catalogs over there, and that's when we had to devote the entire ability of two airplanes just to carry the mail. Uh, but for the most part, it was a good deal for us. But uh, that's one of the things. I remember one night there uh, had an explosion on a boat over there. The boat burned badly. Uh, two people were badly burned in it, and they had to have blood. And uh, the Red Cross called me and asked me, if I could take some blood over there, uh, if they brought it down to me from Los Angeles, which they did, and I flew it over there oh, around nine o'clock one night when I landed in the harbor, and uh, a night landing in a water airplane, especially in the open sea, has a, leaves a lot to be desired. Anyhow, we got by with it and uh, saved the person's life, and uh, we had many such things like that. Yeah. Amphibian aircraft established a new landing site, Pebbly Beach. There was one amphibian air company serving uh, Avalon at the time, which was Avalon Air Transport. Bob Hanley and Dick Prober at one time were partners. Their partnership broke up, so Bob Hanley went to the Santa Catalina Island Company and got this land out here from them and uh, they built this ramp at Pebbly Beach. Our slogan for to fly out of Pebbly Beach was that you didn't have to walk on the shaky floats. You got off on dry land, you walked down. Uh, Bob Hanley and Catalina Channel Airlines was also the originator of the first ones to deliver the passengers directly to their home or their hotel. In those days, when I worked there from uh, 1959 through 62, one-way fare was 563 one way or 1126 round trip. In those days, you could charter a goose for $55 round trip, which is the current airfare one way now on any of the other transportations. It was, uh, it was probably the most used transportation to Catalina 
in those years was the amphibian aircraft. In the early 1980s, Frank Strobel began a freight-only service he christened Catalina Flying Boats. Well, I spent three years out here with the seaplanes, uh, Catalina Flying Boats, which Irene and myself started in 1984. Uh, we used a 1942 Grum and Goose amphib. Uh, we solely did freight uh, for the service. And uh, the area out here was developed in 1959 uh, for seaplanes, amphibians. Uh, through the years, it's been used by uh, seven or eight different operators. And uh, at the time that uh, Catalina Flying Boats was started, uh, there was no air service, seaplane air service, to Catalina for approximately two years. And uh, I sort of had this 25-year dream that uh, uh, about seaplanes that I just thought that a seaplane uh, uh, more or less fit in with what Catalina was all about. It's, they've been here f since the early 20s. Uh, and at that point, uh, my wife Irene uh, asked me if I wanted to do my dream. And uh, this was in 1984, and that's how Catalina Flying Boats got started. My feeling is that just watching the air, the seaplane take off and land is, is the most thrilling thing to me. As soon as you see one, with all that horsepower on the, that wing and taking off and coming off the water like uh, from a fish to a bird. That's, that's the most thrilling part to me. In the late 1980s, amphibian passenger service resumed under the auspices of Catalina Flying Boats. Island air passengers can choose a landing at airports in the sky or fly one of the helicopter services to Pebbly Beach.